You can join me in opening your Bibles to the book of James as we continue our sermon series in uh, that book. And before we begin, I want to read another verse from Isaiah. So we started the service uh, by noting that God dwells in the high and holy place and also with those who are of a lowly and contrite heart and spirit. Uh, later in Isaiah, toward the end of the book, in chapter 66, 2, uh, God declares something similar, but changes the emphasis a bit in a way that's very relevant for what we're doing right now and how we think about the purpose and function of a sermon and how we all should listen to sermons, biblical sermons. So Isaiah 66 says this, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place for my rest? All these my hand has made. And so all these things came to be, declared the Lord. But, so he's talking about where he dwells. I don't need a temple. I make everything. I dwell in the heavens. Then he says this, but this is the one to whom I'll look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. So, the function of a sermon is for us to hear God's Word, which is why we value biblical expository preaching, God's Word being in the driver's seat here. Um, and then all of us, myself included, want to have a disposition and posture of humility before the Lord and a sense of trembling at His Word with this reverent awe and trust. So let's uh, pray for the Lord to even help us do that. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank you for making this amazing promise of grace that you would look toward with favor those who are humble and who tremble at your word. So we pray that your spirit would cultivate that disposition in us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in James uh, chapter 4 this morning, and here's what James has been showing us so far in this series that real Christianity is not just agreeing with facts about Jesus, nor is it just agreeing with or embracing a moral code. It's a relationship with Jesus of trust that changes how we live. So real faith in Jesus, there's a difference between real saving, living faith and a professed belief in Jesus that's dead and not saving. The real kind leads us to change how we think, how we act, and how we treat others. And this morning, we're seeing how it changes the way we talk about other people. Did you know that being a Christian has massive implications for the way that we speak about other people, especially other Christians? So this addresses a widespread problem. Extended family members have negative conversations about other family members. Neighborhoods are filled with neighbor gossip. Workplaces have employees and bosses speaking negatively about one another toward others. News outlets, even Christian ones, are quick to report any negative story about someone else. And they do it because they get the clicks because we like to hear that stuff and share it and pass it on. We live in a cancel culture where if you don't affirm some things, you're condemned. Jesus came into a world like ours, this world, to change this. So when you become a Christian, Jesus becomes your Lord. The first chapter of James says that you are brought forth or born again by the message of the gospel, the word of truth, and that you have God's word planted inside of you like a seed that powerfully works and changes you. And this morning, James shows that a living faith and this word of the gospel planted inside of you changes how you speak about other people. So Christians are to move from a spirit of judgmentalism and criticism to speaking with truth and love. Now, you may be thinking, but I've known a number of Christians who are the worst at this. They constantly speak negatively, critically, judgmentally about others, griping and complaining and groaning. And I would say, that's why we're talking about this today. That's why James wrote this, 
to those early Christians in the beginning because knowing Jesus should change how we speak. And at this point, you may have someone in mind that you think really needs to hear this today, that you're, you're looking around and you're wondering if they're there or they're sitting next to you and you're glad they're there. That may be true, but it's also true that we all need this. In fact, it's possible that someone else in this room is actually thinking about you and they're glad <laughs> that you're here this morning. The truth is we often don't realize how critical and judgmental we are, especially in a culture where this is normalized. So we're looking at just two verses this morning, James 4, verses 11 to 12. James says, the gospel transforms how we talk about people. It leads us to move away from judgmental criticism to speak with truth and honor of others. So let's read these two verses together. If you don't have a Bible with you, by the way, that's on page 1013 in the Bibles that are around you under the chairs. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge? your neighbor. So, the gospel transforms how we talk about people. So, first, we'll see what's wrong with our words, and second, how the gospel transforms our talk. So, first, what is wrong with our words? James begins with a straightforward command, do not speak evil against one another, brothers or brothers and sisters. So, this is the main point. Don't speak evil against each other. If you were here last week, we saw that James has been addressing the theme of conflict, and in particular, conflict among Christians in a church. It's common in the midst of conflict to start assuming bad motives of others. And in church conflicts, it's common to start making personal attacks or assuming the worst of people. And then we take these negative assumptions and we spread them to others. And the whole tone of a relationship or a home or a church can get corrupted by this. And so James is especially focused on how critical speech contributes to conflict. So what kind of critical speech is he addressing here? Two kinds, slander and judgmentalism. So first he's addressing slander. Your translation here may say something like, do not speak against one another or a brother or do not slander. Those are translating a word that refers broadly to various kinds of critical speech. It's usually used to refer to slander or defamation. This is speech that harms someone else's reputation. So it could be a, a false accusation. It could be something that's true but disparaging about someone. It could refer to grumbling against someone. Sometimes it refers to assuming bad motives about someone and speaking those. We don't usually use the word slander anymore, but it's an important one. It refers to speaking falsely about someone else in a way that damages or diminishes their reputation. And this can refer to subtly misrepresenting someone in order to make them look worse than they really are. We slander when we exaggerate something about them in order to make them look worse than they are. It's very common in political conversations in election seasons like the one we're in now. We heard it in the presidential debate in its aftermath this past week. We see it in political ads. We see it in news reports and articles and opinion pieces. People exaggerate the flaws of the people they disagree with in order to influence people's opinions, or they make false claims about the policies that someone else proposes and promotes. It often happens very subtly, so news media outlets, it seems like most of them now, and opinion columns today are biased and slanted, and if you only listen to one news outlet now, and I don't think this used to be the case, but today, if you just listen to one main news outlet, no matter how smart you are 
uh, you are being influenced to believe in thing, things that are not true of other people. And I know this because I've intentionally not listened to just one news outlet. I listen to many of them across the spectrum, many of them I know some of you only listen to, and I hear one set of facts from one that seem really plausible and true and make me really upset. Then I read from the other, and it's a totally different world, a different set of facts. Sometimes both of them are clearly obscuring reality, picking and choosing certain things to influence the readers or listeners to think a certain way about the other side. Sometimes one of them seems to be telling the truth and being somewhat fair in a certain case, another person, another side's not. And so over time, if you're just taking in maybe one side of the spectrum, you are slowly being influenced to believe slander. And again, I, I say no matter how smart you are, I know some of you are brilliant, you are wise, you're way smarter than me. But if you're just listening to one side, the problem is you don't actually know what you're not hearing. Like, they are your view toward reality and stories out there, and they're shaping reality for you. They're delivering a set of facts, framing them in a certain way, and it's impossible actually to know what's true or not unless you are able to get facts from another view or perspective. Now, sadly, you can't just turn to another outlet and say, now here's where I get the true facts. You've kind of got to sort it out yourself. So it's complicated today. So I'm just encouraging you Please don't just listen to one news outlet today because it will influence you to believe slander and you don't even know that. And then your heart is shaped and your mind is shaped um, to believe uh, certain things. A lot more than was in my notes. Um, <laughs> but this is also much closer to home for us. James is addressing how Christians speak against other Christians here. He's addressing how we do this in everyday life. We exaggerate the problems of others. We make unnecessary, negative, critical comments about one another, either to each other or about each other. We're quick to believe the best of ourselves and quick to believe the worst about others. James is not just addressing slander, he's also addressing judgmentalism here. Notice when he says, what he says in verse 11, the one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother. So when we speak critically of someone, we're standing in judgment over them. We're making a moral assessment about someone, like a judge, and then we're declaring it to someone else. Now, here's what James is not saying. He's not saying that we should never correct someone who's in sin or never identify when someone is wrong or in sin or that we can never bring that up with them and help them leave that sin or false belief. James, in fact, is correcting people right here. Is he not discerning a sin in these people and telling them to knock it off, right? So he's doing that. In chapter 5, he'll tell us to do that for others, to bring people back who stray from the truth. So the problem is that we can have a judgmental spirit and take the role of a moral police, so there's a difference between humbly helping someone repent of sin and pridefully judging people all the time. And it doesn't matter if what you're saying is true or not. Just because it's true doesn't mean it should be spread to others. This kind of judgmentalism trickles out in little ways all the time. It happens when you say to your neighbor, have you seen Susie's yard? She just never takes care of it. It's ridiculous. And all the dandelion things are blowing into mine. Or, yeah, I don't really like that change either. I think Tim just does it because he wants power. Or, that candidate is such an idiot. Or, whatever comes after the statement. Now, don't tell anyone I'm saying this about her, but... So, what's so wrong with this kind of slander or judgmentalism? What's wrong with this? The problem is uh, something that I didn't really appreciate for most of my life. And I think many people today have an impoverished view of understanding what's wrong about this, which is why it's so pervasive. The problem has to do with the sacredness of people's reputations. The problem is that this language damages and diminishes the reputation 
of the person you're talking about. It's defaming. And it seems widespread today that we don't really see that as a big deal. James says we're taking the role of a judge. What, is, what do judges do? They make an assessment about someone, and then they give a punishment. When you spread a false or unproven accusation, you're taking the place of a judge, and you're spreading that as though it's true, and you're punishing a person. How are you punishing them? How is spreading a rumor about someone that maybe you think is true, but you're not even sure, how is that punishing someone? Well, the people you spread this bad report to will, on the spot, view the person you're talking about less than they should view them. They'll view the person differently. So as you speak to them, you're diminishing someone's reputation in their mind. Now, past generations, at least some of them and in some cultures, had a deeper understanding of the importance of protecting someone's reputation. We tend to underappreciate just how important it is to honor people's reputation. So I want to give a couple examples from past generations. So the first is from William Ames. So he was an English Puritan author in the 1600s. He wrote a systematic theology called The Marrow of Theology. And he has a section in his theology called The Honor of Our Neighbor. It's in a larger section on the topic of justice. And this section is on what we owe our neighbor in terms of honor and how we're to uphold our neighbor's reputation as a matter of justice. So our culture loves talking about justice today. Many who talk about justice have no concern for the injustice of damaging reputations. Now, I've read a lot of modern systematic theologies. I can't remember any of them addressing this topic, but Ames gives several pages to it. He says we owe honor to people, honor as it relates to the opinion of people, um, the, the opinion people have of someone else's reputation. He grounds it in the New Testament with statements that say, of course, children honoring parents, and then we owe honor to certain people and owe honor to everyone. So here's what he says we owe people as a matter of justice. He says the duty of honor which we owe to all is to preserve their state of dignity unhurt. All offenses which hurt the reputation of our neighbor are opposed to this duty. The reputation of our neighbor is hurt, however, when the esteem due him is diminished. That's really clear. So there are offenses that hurt the reputation of our neighbor, and that means that the esteem that our neighbor is owed and the dignity they should be viewed with is diminished. And that's an offense, and it's an injustice. And then he says that slander is one way that we diminish someone's reputation without cause. And he says that slander is evil in four ways. Here are the four. First, when he's falsely accused of a fault. Second, when a secret fault is made public without just cause. Right? So something might be true, there might be a real fault about someone, but if there's no just cause for making it public and spreading it, that's evil. Third, when an actual fault is exaggerated. And fourth, when an act is not condemned, but the intention is. Here's another example of how past generations can teach us to care about this more. The Westminster Larger Catechism teaches theology in a question and answer format. And in one section, it teaches on the ninth commandment. This is question 144, and this was handed to you when you came in today uh, with your half sheet. So I printed it out so you can just keep this with you, um, and maybe that would be helpful for you to grow in this um, as I want to grow as well. So what's the question that this answers? Well, this is one long paragraph on answering the question about what the ninth commandment uh, requires of us. So the ninth commandment is this, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now that puts it negatively, what we're not to do. Uh, but what does that command imply about how we should speak about people? Positively. 
So the Westminster Larger uh, Catechism has this all in one long paragraph. I've put it in bullet points so that we can follow it a little more closely. So let's read this uh, together, and then I'll, I'll just make comments as we go. The duties required in the Ninth Commandment are the preserving and promoting of truth between man and man and the good name of our neighbor as well as our own. So notice, very first thing here, this is, this is about both truth and the good name of our neighbor, which is a way of referring to the reputation. So we are to preserve and promote the good name and reputation of our neighbor. Next it says, appearing and standing for the truth. And from the heart, sincerely, freely, clearly, and fully speaking the truth and only the truth in matters of judgment and justice and in all other things whatsoever. Next, a charitable esteem of our neighbor. So, not just not assuming the worst of others, but assuming the best of people. Loving, desiring, and rejoicing in their good name. Their good name being their, their reputation, their good reputation. So we are to love their good reputation, rejoice in others' good reputation, desire it, sorrowing for and covering of their infirmities, freely acknowledging of their gifts and graces, defending their innocency, a ready receiving of a good report, and an unwillingness to admit of an evil report concerning them. So, being happy to hear good news about people and their reputation, and being unwilling, being, not being willing to receive and believe slander and gossip about people. Discouraging talebearers, flatterers, and slanders. So this isn't just not receiving, but this is actively discouraging gossip and slander and judgmentalism toward other people. Love and care of our own good name and defending it when need requires. So there are times when it is right for you to defend your own reputation that's being diminished because reputation matters so much. Keeping of lawful promises, studying and practicing of whatever things are true, honest, lovely, and of good report. So here, here's why all of this is helpful for us. James is assuming something here in these two verses that William Ames and the writers of the Westminster Larger Catechism understood, but that many of us today don't, that someone's reputation is sacred, and other people's reputations are not yours to do whatever you want with. Diminishing someone's reputation is not morally neutral, whether you do it in a conversation or you do it on social media, or you do it by sharing an article or a podcast, diminishing someone else's reputation without warrant, or you are a journalist and your job is to write about things. There are implications of these verses and the Ninth Commandment for how you go about your vocation. And those of you who have had slander spread about you have felt how serious this is. Maybe you've had a neighbor spread lies about you. Maybe you've had a coworker exaggerate one of your faults to other people in a form of slander. Maybe you felt like other church members have whispered and gossiped about you. Or maybe you're in middle school or high school and you've had other students make fun of you and spread things around that either aren't true or maybe that are, but had, they had no business being spread around to other people. Or they spread something that, that tore your reputation down. I have friends who have had articles published about them and podcasts about them that are filled with subtle slander. And it's an injustice. So if you've had unfounded rumors spread about you, you know the deep pain of this. And I want you to know that you're not crazy for feeling that kind of pain. You were wronged. And James says to Christians, this is something that is wrong with our words. We speak against and we judge one another. So how do we change? 
So second, how the gospel transforms our talk. Christians uh, don't believe that we change just by hearing that this is wrong. So we already knew that this was wrong deep down. So far in this sermon, I've told you nothing that, that your conscience hasn't already been somewhat sensitive to, at least in the past, maybe it's been seared. And by clarifying it, that doesn't mean we're all just going to change. We don't change also by just trying harder. It's just because our words flow from our hearts and our view of the world. So James has shown throughout the letter that we change by the active true faith in Jesus from our hearts. So James says in chapter 1 that the word of truth, the gospel, is planted in our hearts when we trust in Jesus. So there's a seed inside of us. We're given a new heart. And the message of Jesus, the word of truth, is planted in there. And it begins by the Spirit's power to work and grow and change our hearts, which then changes the way that we speak. So the gospel is the message of Jesus that is good news for people whose lives are bad news and who often spread bad news. And the deeper we go with this message of Jesus, the deeper we trust Him, the more we change. So what does the process of change look like for Christians in light of what we've been talking about this morning? How does this actually happen, especially with our words? Well, James shows us here how slander and judgmentalism really are an outflow from how we view four realities. We have a certain way of viewing and and seeing the world, four realities in particular, and the way we view things leads to us speaking with slander and judgmentalism. And so, the word of truth, the gospel of Jesus, changes how we view four realities. And as we have a new view of these things and think about them differently from our mind and heart, that will change how we speak. Okay, so what are the four realities that the gospel changes? It changes how we view other Christians, how we view God's laws, how we view God Himself, and how we view ourselves. So first, how we view other Christians. Verse 11, here James is especially focused on how Christians talk about other Christians, and he's dealing with conflict in the church, and he says, the one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother, speaking of brothers and sisters in Christ. So critical speech against fellow Christians is rooted in pride. When we slander, we're lifting ourselves up over another brother or sister, and we do that by cutting them down. We judge them. So we're stepping up into the judge's chair, and we're looking down at them. And then we're telling other people, you should look down on them as well. So our words are used to get people to look down on other people. We're diminishing their reputation. We bring them low so we can feel good about being higher than them. So how does the gospel change our view of other Christians? Well, it humbles us. It says that we're sinners just like them, and Jesus died for both of us. So it it actually gives us the righteousness we're longing for. So we have this self-justification and self-righteousness when we slander and criticize. We, We want to feel righteous over against the other person. But the gospel tells us when you trust in Jesus, you get His righteousness. You're already clothed in righteousness. You don't need to self justify You are justified by faith. So you don't need to feel righteous by putting other people down. When we speak negatively of other believers, it's coming from a failure to view them as they really are in Christ as well. But now we can see that other Christians are brothers and sisters. We see them as equally adopted into God's family, equally loved as children of God. So the the gospel humbles us not to take the role of a judge over against them, but the role of a brother or sister alongside them. John Newton, the 1700s pastor and author, wrote the song Amazing Grace, which we sang, I think, last Sunday. He helps us here. So he wrote a letter to someone giving advice on how to engage in controversy. And by the way, I encourage you to go grab a copy. We we don't have it here, but a copy of the, the letters of John Newton. They're really great, really encouraging, filled with insight. And so in one of the letters, he's giving someone advice. How do you engage in controversy, disagreement with someone? He said that if you have a disagreement with a fellow believer, even if they are greatly mistaken about something, you should remember this about the other person. Here's what he wrote. The Lord loves him and bears with him. Therefore, you must not despise him or treat him harshly. 
the Lord bears with you likewise and expects that you should show tenderness to others from a sense of the much forgiveness you need yourself. Do you see how he's applying the gospel to this? You need forgiveness just as much as them. That should humble you. And then he says, in a little while, you will meet in heaven. He will then be dearer to you than the nearest friend you have upon earth is to you now. Anticipate that period in your thoughts. And though you may find it necessary to oppose his errors, so he's not saying you can't disagree, not saying you can't even publicly disagree with someone, but though you may find it necessary to oppose his errors, view him personally as a kindred soul with whom you are to be happy in Christ forever. How would that change so much of the way Christians talk about other Christians in conversation, on social media, in articles, and so forth? Okay, but what if you're disagreeing with someone who's not a Christian? Is that like, well, then you can be condemning and, and, and the rest. Well, he says, this person then is actually in a state of enmity with God and in need of grace. So Newton says, he is more a proper object of your compassion than your anger. And that should change how you speak. He then appeals especially to how our doctrine should lead us to treat others with love. He says this, of all people who engage in controversy, we who are called Calvinists, are most expressly bound by our own principles to the exercise of gentleness and moderation. So Calvinists, those who believe that God is the decisive factor in determining who is saved, they're those that believe that God is the one who graciously opens our eyes to the truth, both at conversion and even to come out of a false belief. So, he, so Newton's saying, as a Calvinist, he's saying, listen, if you claim to be one who, who believes that God is the one who changes minds and hearts, then you believe he changed yours, no thanks to you. All grace for you to see the truth. And you also believe then that in order for this person you disagree with to see the truth, God has to open their eyes. It's not going to be through the force of your will. So he's saying, based upon our own principles, that should lead you to be the most humble debater, the most gentle and reasonable person rather than prideful. It should lead you to pray because God is the one who opens eyes. So the gospel changes how we view other Christians. Second, the gospel changes how we view God's laws. When we slander and judge others, we think that we're enforcing God's law. When we speak against someone, we're essentially saying, hey, this person is violating God's standard, and I'm going to point it out to tell everybody. But if you spread gossip and slander, what are you actually doing? You're breaking God's law. So look at verse 11. This is, this is the reasoning that James has here. The one who speaks against a brother or judges a brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. So the law in view is probably Leviticus 19.16 says, don't go around slandering a brother. And that comes right in the same context of the love command. Love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So gossip, slander, judgmental speech is a violation of the love command. So here's James's point. We may think that we are upholding the law by going around as the moral police. And James is saying, you are not upholding the law. You are actually breaking the law in doing this. And he's saying that you are acting like a judge, so you're actually picking and choosing which laws you want to obey. So you'll pick the one to condemn someone else for breaking, while you go and break the law in doing that, because it's slander. The gospel changes us, though. How so? Well, once again, it humbles us. The gospel tells us that we have pridefully put ourselves over God's law and broken it in many ways, but God has given us forgiveness and grace through Jesus. And so now, if you are a Christian, if you have come to Jesus through faith, you now see the law as both the thing that points out your sin, but also now because you've been forgiven, you receive it as a gift. You see that it reflects God's character and is a pathway and a guide. And so you gladly follow God's law. Third, the gospel changes how we view God. 
When we view and criticize others, we're pridefully taking the place of God Himself. Notice verse 12. James says that you're acting like a judge, but there is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and destroy. So he's saying when you act like the moral police, you are taking the role of a lawgiver or a law enforcer, but that is the role of God, not you. And so the gospel, once again, humbles us to acknowledge that God alone is the lawgiver and judge. So the gospel tells us that He is the judge. We've broken His law. Because of this, we deserve to be destroyed. But notice what James says here. God is the one who's able to save and destroy. He's able to save. Now, why would James say that? It's a reminder that God saves lawbreakers. So He is gracious to us. Jesus came as the perfect law keeper, the only perfect law keeper. On the cross, He takes the judgment we deserve. He was treated like a lawbreaker for us, and He was judged so we could be saved. And this then leads us to see that God alone is the Savior and judge, and so our role is not to go around judging and condemning and destroying people. Instead, we humbly receive His salvation, and we treat others with dignity. Finally, the gospel changes how we view ourselves. James ends with the question, who are you to judge? And it's a rhetorical question. What's the answer? Well, pride would say, I'm a judge. I can do this. But when we've been humbled by the gospel, we realize, I have no place to judge. I'm a fellow sinner saved by grace. The reality is, when you and I misrepresent someone, spread unfounded bad information about someone, or diminish someone's reputation, then this shows that our heart has become proud. We have lifted ourselves up above someone else. We've torn them down to make ourselves feel self-righteous. And again, this doesn't mean that we cannot or should not humbly help someone repent when they've sinned. That is not what he's saying. Again, James is literally doing that here, humbly coming alongside, identifying sin, and calling them to repent. But this does mean that we do not pridefully condemn and slander people all the time. So when we're humbled by the gospel, we view people with love and compassion. And we don't feel a prideful urge to lie and spread rumors in order to tear them down or to make ourselves feel better for the day. So what do we do in light of all this? Well, first, we all probably have something to repent of. Have you been quick to believe a bad report about somebody? Have you been quick to assume the worst of people's motives? Have you spread something negative about someone that you were not sure was true? Or maybe you were sure was not true? Do you drink in the news media and let it uncritically shape your view of people without intentionally, intentionally listening to other perspectives? Because you assume that because you're kind of politically aligned or ideologically aligned with the news outlet that you receive it from, you can trust them to be giving you the truth. Have you spread rumors of someone in your family or in the church or in your school? If so, then sometime, perhaps right now or later today uh, or before you go to bed, ask the Lord for forgiveness. Receive His grace through Jesus. I've mentioned before from the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says one of the things that we as believers should be praying regularly is forgive us our sins. And one of the best times to do that, other than the moment after we do commit the sin, is just before bed. So before you close your eyes, just think back with the Lord's help. Lord, have I sinned today in a way that I've not seen or I need to deal with? And then you confess that and ask Him to forgive you. So tonight even, just think, okay, Lord, how have I been critical or judgmental of others or done these things? Please forgive me. And if you need to apologize to another person, because you've diminished their reputation unnecessarily, uh, then go apologize to them. Diminishing a reputation of someone is not morally neutral. You had no right to do that. Reputation is sacred. In fact, you had the obligation to uphold the dignity of someone else. So you may need to repent. Second, if you have had your reputation damaged, look to Jesus. Jesus knows what that's like. He came with moral perfection. 
He, he was the one that should have been most highly esteemed by everyone, and yet he was slandered. So if you have had your name drug through the dirt, he understands. He knows experientially what you're going through. Maybe you feel like your reputation was damaged and it actually was warranted. Even then, look to Jesus because on the cross he bore your shame and your guilt and your sin. And you are united to him by faith. So even if your reputation was diminished and you think, you know, I deserve that, then you have a new reputation united to Jesus. You are clothed in his righteousness. You are a loved son or daughter of God. And if you're not yet united to Christ, you can become a Christian today. You can trust him with a true and living faith. You can receive a new reputation joined to him. You can go from his enemy to his friend. You can go from being judged to accepted. So if you want this, just turn to him in prayer. Ask him for forgiveness. Ask him to accept you through Jesus and ask him to help you. Follow him as Lord. And then third and last, this, let the gospel change how you talk. So we want to be a church filled with people who speak both truth and love. We want to cultivate a gospel culture of honor. So I mentioned last week that we are in a wonderful season as a church right now. God has given us a gospel culture of love and peace and kindness. And the only way we keep a gospel culture like this is if we actively and intentionally guard it and cultivate it. And so this morning, we're seeing one important way that we do this is that we guard one another's reputation with honor. We refuse to speak slander and spread slander. We gently but firmly help others stop gossiping and spreading slander as well. And we do this because, as we've seen here in James, the word of truth, the gospel, gets planted in us and changes the way we view life. It changes the way we view one another as loved brothers and sisters. It changes the way we view God's law, which is something that we're not to police, but to receive gladly. And, and we changes the way we view God. He's the one who judges and destroys, and also the one who saves lawbreakers like us. And it changes the way that we um, view one another as well and ourselves. So we are humbled before him. We recognize that we're sinners in need of grace and mercy. So all of life is changed. So this is the gospel culture that James is seeking to cultivate by giving this simple, straightforward command, do not speak evil against one another. And we've seen why this matters so much, because God has created us with dignity, and we should honor one another's reputation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, this truth, and we pray that you would continue to do your work through your word. We want to be low before you and tremble at your word, and so we want to be humble to receive whatever correction each one of us needs to receive. We pray that you would work in our hearts whatever repentance we need to have and to express toward you or apologies we need to make to others. We pray that you would, by your Spirit's power, continue to cultivate a culture among us of joy and safety and honor in our church family. We thank you for giving us this as a church. We pray that you would cause us to continue to be grateful and cultivate it all the more. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.